Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Director Mr. Subramaniam, and uh, faculty of CMR University, students and participants. It is a pleasure for me to be addressing the audience, because as I was sharing with uh, Dr. Shashikala, that uh, we, have, we have come to a stage in life where we must share whatever we have with others who do not have to the extent that we have. Obviously, a teacher of criminal law who started his teaching of postgraduate criminal law classes in 1962 obviously will have a head-on advantage over a younger colleague. Because over a period of time, I seem to have gathered certain experiences. And sharing this experience, to me, is a wealth that I share with younger generations. Uh, when Professor Subramaniam, whose uh, request is almost a command to me, because uh, he had uh, invited me to NUJS, Calcutta, and organized wonderful programs. Uh, I think he was saying 19 programs, orientation programs on different branches of law in his Center for Regulatory Studies. So when he requested me, despite all the trouble that comes in uh, descending down from the hills of Nainital, down to uh, Bangalore, which is again a beautiful climate, but uh, the journey part was really arduous. But I had to bear that journey fatigue, that journey strain, and I am here before you addressing a set of young people who want to share some knowledge with me. And it's a sheer pleasure for me to be sharing some knowledge. And knowledge on a branch, on a theme, that to my mind has become very vital in the society today. Constitutional foundations of criminal justice under tension. Now, everybody, everything is under tension in our present society, which is in a pace of transition. Real transition has come now with technology making its impact, with economics making its impact. Everything is spoken in terms of pound, shilling and pence. Everything is spoken in terms of digital, electronics. And therefore the society is really in the throes of a transition. And so, when I saw your concept note, uh, there were three points that had, it had underscored. One, the crime scene is undergoing a transition. Crimes are committed by intelligent, educated people. Then crimes are committed by powerful people, privileged class deviants privileged class crimes. And the third was there has been a spurt in heinous crimes against women and children. The first two are different, the third is different. Why this spurt in heinous crimes against women and children? Now that concept note to that, uh, Dr. Subramaniam added a few more insight into the transformation here. Uh, but what I am saying is, the introductory part in Constitutional Foundation is, there is a disconnect between the constitutional thinking and the other law thinking, 
This connect is because we have thought constitutional law is something which is to be taught in the classroom. I recall in National Judicial Academy in Bhopal, I was uh, addressing a batch of 60 district and session judges on constitution, relevance of constitution for district judiciary. And uh, quite a few of them, two, three of them were very forcey for us. They said district judiciary has nothing to do with the constitution. How are we concerned with the constitution? We are concerned with, uh, we have no power under Article 226, 227. We have no rich jurisdiction, 32. So how is constitution relevant for us? I was trying to mull up the point that constitution is the foundation all of exercise of justicing power. And it took me a lot of time by that time, one High Court Judge, Justice Baran Ghosh, he intervened, he said what Professor is saying is absolutely right. All justicing power is driven, drawn from the Constitution. What you are doing day to day is a constitutional power. Therefore, it is very important to learn about it. And no one has done it better than A.G. Noorani in writing a foreword to a handbook of human rights and criminal justice in India. In 2007, A.G. Noorani had said this, while every work on British constitutional law discusses at length the status and powers of police, books on constitution of India ignore the profound importance of police in a polity governed by the rule of law. We think that there is a disconnect, it's a police power or a CRPC is not, we are teaching constitution, we are not teaching CRPC. We are teaching criminal law, we are not teaching constitution. So constitutional law teacher is separate. There is a disconnect, but this disconnect has to be bridged by telling you that constitutional foundation is as important for teaching criminal law, as important for teaching criminal procedure law, as constitution itself. Teaching of constitutional foundation is limited by Nurani for the state of disconnect. This disconnect has to be bridged. We have to make a setu to connect the constitution and other subjects. The second issue is why it is it has become all the more important to recall the constitutional foundations today. Today we are, there are times in the history of a nation when the faith in normative system of rule of law gets wavered. There is a, the atre of normative system is under What about norm? We don't bother about norm. Constitution doesn't bind us. What is constitution? It is a parchment, a paper document, which was brought about on 26th January 1950. We disregard the constitution. Many countries, many people have this. As against this, today people are saying constitution and rule of law is a set of power resource. Through constitution, we derive power. Through criminal law, criminal procedure law, we de derive power. And uh, we'll use criminal law as a power resource. That is getting away from the normative understanding of rule of law, 
to a neutral understanding of rule of law. Rule of law as a power resource. This thinking has dawned in the society. More and more people are thinking, use law to embellish your power. Use law to put the other man into trouble. Use law as a power resource, intentionally or inadvertently, in order to divide people, in order to weaken the other man. When it comes to using law, people want clever lawyers. Can you use the law for us? That is a violation that is an erosion of normative fidelity of law. Law has certain fidelity, the norm has certain fidelity. And the third challenge is, the third interactive comment is that there are two ways of thinking, approaching the constitutional foundation. Constitutional foundation can be approached as an aspect of criminal justice, purely criminal jurisprudence. As an aspect of criminal jurisprudence, in the Western societies, uh, criminal justice foundations have been understood on the basis of the four principles. The harm principle, Nothing, no conduct which does not cause harm should be a crime. The harm principle. There should be a clear-cut harm to this individual or to the society. The autonomy principle, the second, which is very important, you should not make criminal law which takes away the autonomy, which dilutes the autonomy of the other man. Third, the culpability principle. No one who is not culpable, who is not guilty, who has no mens rea, should be made liable. And the fourth is equality principle. Criminal law should apply equally to all people. This equality principle is under great siege today. You want one criminal law for the killing major and the other criminal law for ordinary killers. Military killers are different. Some newspapers had given that title that uh, major who kills is different kind of killing. Killing is killing. The person is killed. There might be justifications, and, but justification should not uh, go to the extent of... Uh, so, the equality principle, uh, I will discuss this when I come to the point. Professor Andrew Ashworth, writing in a very, very succinct paper in 2000, in Law Quarterly Review, is criminal law a lost cause? Professor Andrew Ashworth is a great thinker of criminal law in the UK. Andrew Ashworth wrote, is criminal law a lost cause? And he said the four basic foundational elements of criminal law are censoring only for substantial wrongdoings. You should censor only for substantial wrongdoings. Is uttering triple talaq a substantial wrongdoing? In the sense of harm principle, does it really cause harm that needs to be taken up? Then second is Punishment should be proportionate to the seriousness of harm. Supposing, we were discussing yesterday, for most of the crime today, 
people are saying death penalty for rape below 12 death penalty for murder death penalty then death penalty for how many things in uk yesterday somebody was talking on death penalty in 1726 act 212 offenses were listed as death penalty crimes 212 offenses meted out with death penalty and the same united kingdom abolished death penalty in 1976 1726 212 offenses met punished with death in 1976 death penalty abolished now you move from 1726 to 1976 and you abolish a punishment that is the shift that takes place in societies there should be punishment proportionate to the seriousness of the wrong third is equal treatment and proportionality this is becoming according to andrew ashford even in england you have two procedures one for economic offenders there is a reconciliatory procedure today also there is a recommendation by the government if you declare your black income uh, up to 5 crore rupees will be exempted now you are giving amnesty but for the thief there will be a elaborate trial there will be witnesses there will be evidence and he will be given 3 years in prison so andrew ashford is saying even in england you are using two procedures one soft procedure for economic offenders that are robbing the nation worth millions of rupees and one harsh procedure for the thief that is in england not in india then according due process protections to all wrong doers every wrong doer is entitled to due process protections if you short circuit the due process protections you are violating the criminal justice foundations now when you come to the constitutional indian constitutional foundations i have discussed only identified underscored five constitutional foundations of criminal justice five of them the first is the requirement of being consistent to fundamental right consistency requirement underscored under article 131 and 132 if there is any law which is inconsistent with fundamental right it is void ab initio very significant 131 had to come into the constitution because at the time of enactment of the constitution in 1950 a criminal justice system was already in place there was ipc 1860 there was crpc 1898 there was evidence act 1872 everything was in place so the nation had an alternate two alternatives one disband the old colonial laws and make new ipc new crpc new evidence act that was very arduous so the constitution makers including ambedkar and others they said under article 372 adapt the old colonial criminal justice system adaptation clause 372 but adaptation alone is not enough subject all the colonial laws to article 31 13 one scrutiny 
scrutiny of consistency with fundamental right. Pahli scrutiny, first scrutiny. All laws should be consistent with fundamental rights. Now, this is very difficult. All laws have to be consistent with fundamental right. Uh, uh, Macaulay's laws. There was a conference in uh, Singapore in 2012 to which I was invited, and I presented a paper. I didn't realize at the time of going for the conference, it was very elaborately organized by National Law University Singapore, uh, in which uh, most of the organizers were hard-boiled Macaulay fans. It was part of a project of Canada, uh, 10 million project, 10 million dollar project, that uh, how to study the contribution of Macaulay, because the same penal code applies to Singapore, Malaysia, India, and earlier to Ceylon. So Singapore was interested in the IPC, and so 150 years of IPC. So when I presented my paper, I said, the ideas of Macaulay have to pass through the constitutional sieve now. Oh, they didn't like this idea. Oh, what is this constitutional sieve? What is this? I said, because that is a requirement of the law. Constitution's first foundation is 13.1. And I realized that when I studied Constitution, when I studied criminal law, I didn't realize the value of 13.1. So most of us do not care about 13.1. We care about Article 12, state. But we don't care so much about 13.1. I know it because as a teacher I have full understanding. 13.1 dawned into my mind much later. 13.1 not only says that colonial laws will have to be subject to fundamental rights, but 13.2 says any future laws will have to pass through the same scrutiny of consistency with fundamental rights. The future law can be triple talaq law, can be criminal justice 213, can be juvenile justice, heinous offending uh, 16, 18 age group law. They have to pass through the scrutiny of 132. If it is in conflict with many things do not come before the court, because I see uh, 13 uh, Juvenile Justice Act uh, section which says that uh, heinous offending juveniles between 16 and 18 shall be tried as adult criminal is in violation of Article 13.2 because 13.2 read with section 15, article 15.3. Article 15.3 says, any law in favor of women and children shall not be subject to article 15, clause 1. And law in this favor cannot be read as in favor. You are making a law in this favor of 16-18 heinous offending juvenile, therefore this is violation of Article 13.2. If somebody challenges it, makes a test case before the Supreme Court, Supreme Court will have difficulty. Therefore, the requirement of consistency, Article 13.1 and 13.2. The second foundation is the requirement of equality and non-discrimination in terms of Article 14 and 15. There shall be no discrimination on ground of sex. There shall be no discrimination on ground of race, caste, sex, etc., etc. 
Sex is mentioned in Article 15.1. When you discriminate between child marriage and discriminate between child wife and adult wife, under Article, under Section 375, Exception 2, intercourse by a husband with his own wife above the age of 15 shall not be rape, you exempt. You discriminate between adult wife and child wife. How can you do it? It is in violation of 15.3. So, we'll discuss this when we come to it. So, requirement of equality and equal protection. This is second constitutional foundation. Third constitutional foundation is guarantee of right to life and personal liberty under Article 21. This is much broader. Guarantee of life and personal liberty to citizens and non-citizens. Chandriman Das a citizen of Bangladesh, she could get compensation under Article 21 for being raped in railway retiring room in Calcutta by railway employees. She could claim compensation before our Supreme Court in Chandramada's case. So, Article 21 is much wider. And Article 21 has become the foundational, foundation of so many other rights. And the law has enormously grown around it. So this is the third constitutional foundation. And the fourth constitutional foundation is uh, special protection to the accused. Today people might say that the constitution is pro-accused. Criminal justice system is pro-accused. It should be pro-victim also. Uh, that has to be built into by properly formulating and agitating for it. There is no denying that victims have had a raw deal. In Article 20, Clause A, B and C, the accused has been given special protection. And this is because it uh, is based on the thinking that uh, the single accused in the hands of powerful state requires additional protection. And that's a fact when you see accused, whoever he is, he requires certain additional protections. And finally, the, the fifth foundation is the requirement of upholding citizens' right to six freedoms under Article 19.1. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom. Citizens have certain rights, right to certain freedoms, six freedoms. And you cannot, these are constitutional foundations. And when you make criminal law, you have to think of these constitutional foundations. Now, all these constitutional foundations are complied with a composite uh, structure of criminal justice system, starting with legislature on the one end. Legislature makes the law. Then the police enforces the law at the investigation stage. Then prosecution comes in at prosecution stage. Then the courts come in at the trial stage. Courts have been given in our system a very prepondering role in the foundation of constitutional foundations. Courts come in at the time of investigation also. Courts come in at the time of prosecution also. Courts come in at the time of trial, adducing of evidence. Courts come in at the time of uh, inference, drawing inference from the evidence. They are subject only to presumptions. Court shall presume, court must presume, court may presume. 
and then media also, then advocates also. They are part of the criminal justice system. Media has started playing a very vital role today. Little understanding their responsibility sometimes. You have seen the case of uh, Arushi Talwar. The whole case was messed up by the media hype. Media started a story of parents involved in the murder. And that story was carried by the CBI. And High Court said that this story doesn't have head or tail. The conviction for which the parents had been in the prison for three years or more was baseless. There should not have been any conviction. Now there is an appeal and the parents are out mercifully. So media gets into the criminal justice system. Uh, not that media's role is not important. In a democracy, media is very important, but there should be a responsible media. Now, I have identified five tension points, five foundations and five tension points. There could be more tension points. First tension point is uh, I have my own understanding of the tension points. Somebody may differ from me. I don't say. Uh, the society, and particularly the state, here the union government, has reiterated the traditional attitude and mindset before the court on two occasions. One, when in the, one of the cases, Independent Thought versus Union of India, decided by the Supreme Court, Justice Lukur and Justice Deepak Gupta in 2017. In the effort of it, the union government said, that we are aware that child marriage is continuing in our society. That in some states it is up to 52%. Child Marriage Prohibition Act ordinance was passed first time by the colonial government in 1929-28. Colonial rulers were bad people. They prohibited child marriage. Then it was reiterated in 2006 by the government, Child Marriage Restraint Act 2006. The child marriage in 2017, before the Supreme Court, the union government is saying, we have got to accept it as a necessary evil. Very kind of you. You are accepting it. It is a crime, but we are accepting it as a necessary evil. Now You are not able to change the mindset, the social attitudes. You have to intensively do it. But all the same, it is a crime. Justice Deepak Gupta, in his judgment, there are two separate judgments by two judges. Justice Lokur is uh, much more soft on the government. But Justice Deepak Gupta is very, very harsh. He said, it doesn't behove you to say that necessities is enough justification for filing this kind of affidavit that it is necessary, evil. We have to bear with it. And they said that child marriage, in both the cases, independent thought and the next case, which is before Delhi High Court, and the judgment is awaited, is RIT Foundation. In RIT Foundation, also 370, Section 375, Exception 2, has been challenged by an NGO, RIT Foundation. 
In independent thought, it was only in respect of child rape. 375 discrimination between child wife and other children. So 375 exception 2 must go. Their attack was limited. In RIT Foundation, their attack is much broader. In RIT Foundation also, the union government in August 2017 has given an affidavit. that uh, some Western countries may have changed the law. But we are not supposed to be blindly following the Western countries. We have our own problems. Therefore, if marital exemption goes, the institution of marriage will be destabilized. Marital exemption will be used as a tool to harass the husbands, poor husbands. Nothing to talk about poor wives, poor husbands. Poor wives have been wrongly handled for generations. You bear with it. 1860, why don't you? So, these two major planks of their affidavit. Now, you see it in the light of Article 13.1 and Article 13.2. Do they create tension or not? I am surprised and I must talk uh, to some of the senior advocates who are in both the cases, Colin Gonzalez, etc., etc. Why no lawyer raised the argument of 13.1 and 13.2 before the Supreme Court or before the High Court? Because we are used to the traditional mindset. Once a marriage, always a marriage. Once consent, always consent. Now, in England, once consent, Always a consent rule was changed in 1991, my House of Lords. In India, once a consent, always a consent, because we are kind people. We don't want to upset the... One, to my mind, the point of tension. The other point of tension is what I saw in the administration of criminal justice. A new kind of activism seems to have introduced. And that is through encounter, encounter criminal justice. And that was very much in evidence in UP. The chief minister said that there have been uh, 1,200 or more encounters in which 43 persons, or he seemed to, he said that in assembly, at least the newspaper reported that. And many people, even senior police officers, like Prakash Singh, they justified it to, to create fear in the mind of criminals. Now you think encounter criminal justice means what? There is no arrest, there is no trial, there is no finding of guilt. There is final judgment and elimination. Now, does it uh, uh, militate against uh, Article 21? Does it militate against Article 14? It, uh, which one will you select? It's your decision. Uh, a gym trainer in Meerut was encountered. He was body dikhata hai. No, if it was found out that he was a gym trainer, encounter ho gaya, galat encounter ho gaya, ka koi baat nahi. Dekha jayega. You will see it. Now, a kind of encounter jurisprudence seems to be emerging in the 21st century, which to my mind is 
and the matters are before the state human rights commission national human rights commission etc etc differential application of criminal law article 14 is premised that the same kind of procedure will be followed in all cases and in subramanya swami versus cbi 2014 five judge bench of justice lodha declared very categorically one procedure for under secretary and above corruption and one procedure for people for corruption below under secretary level is violation of article 14 करप्शन इज करप्शन बड़े का करप्शन अफसर का करप्शन कम करप्शन है और छोटे का करप्शन बुरा करप्शन है देर इज नथिंग लाइक दिस सो सेक्शन सिक्स ए ऑफ द स्पेशल पावर्स एक्ट 1946 फोर्टी सिक्स इज वॉयलेटिव ऑफ आर्टिकल फोर्टीन ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बट differential application doesn't remain only in the matter of corruption in corruption cases also there is a later case uh, narayan swami's case 1916 a case from karnataka in which two judge bench said that uh, article uh, section 19 of prevention of corruption act says Uh, the requirement of sanction for prosecuting a government servant there should be a sanction before prosecuting him and that requirement is uh, before investigation can be begun so an application under 15663 that asks the, the that gives power to the magistrate to order the police to register an fir also cannot be made without sanction now you are creating uh, holy cows in the field of corruption holy cows in the field of uh, uh, this is violation of article 14 holy cows in the field of uh, enforcement of law and order that uh, major skilling is different from ordinary killing so major kills person goes to heaven and ordinary person kills he goes to the hell major's bullet is a soft bullet no how can you have two kinds of criminals and two kinds of victims good victim and bad victim cow eating victim is a bad victim beef eating victim is a bad victim and other victims are good victim so how can you have good criminal and bad criminal this is violation of article 14 i would say don't take it so far that differential application is uh, becomes a conflict with article 14 so i have trouble in understanding these certain developments now the fifth tension point fourth tension point is uh, inability of rule of law rule rule out torture free executive process we assume that in the investigation in the interrogation some element of torture is necessary ऊपर लटकाएंगे डंडा मारेंगे पैर में सम टॉर्चर इज नेसेसरी नाउ व्हाट इज हैपनिंग टुडे दैट मेनी मेनी एक्यूज वी आर नॉट एबल टू गेट देम बैक टू इंडिया लाइक माल्या लाइक नीरव मोदी माल्या साहब नीरव मोदी साहब बिकॉज दे हैव फाइल पिटिशन इन देयर कंट्री दैट extradition should be blocked because in india there is no anti torture law 
we will be subject to torture we will be subject to third degree but still our government is not interested in uh, in either getting malya or in making anti torture law whatever you might think so that becomes a ploy for remaining out ploy for defeating extradition proceedings एक्सीडिशन प्रोसीडिंग हो रहा है उनके वकील के आर्ग्यू कर रहे हैं इनके यहाँ एंटी टॉर्चर लॉ नहीं है एंटी टॉर्चर लॉ हम नहीं बना रहे हैं क्यों नहीं बना रहे हो वाई आर यू नॉट मेकिंग इट बिकॉज दिस इज बींग यूज बाय द एनिमीज ऑफ द नेशन नो नो एंटी टॉर्चर इज वर्स देन एनिमीज ऑफ द नेशन एनिमीज ऑफ द नेशन आर ओनली रॉबिंग यू ऑफ प्यू प्यू थाउजेंड क्रोर्स by police will get annoyed if they are required to have torture free procedure how will they interrogate badi kripa hai if they are not able to interrogate what will you do and the last tension point i would say temptation of going in for a empowered criminal justice system unfortunately a kind of thinking seems to have that is at the root of encounter criminal justice that is at the root of anti torture law criminal justice no anti torture law criminal justice that is at the root of empowered criminal justice in november 2017 the central government in a, a director general of police conference resolved three things exhumed the malimath committee of 2003 and from that malimath committee three things were exhumed one is increasing the police remand period from 15 days to 30 days now efficient technologically backed up police should be able to reduce the remand period from 15 days to 7 days humne 7 din mein detect kar liya because we are using all scientific methods i was impressed in the delhi railway station where policemen were carrying big lanterns electronic lanterns to detect criminals that is drug drug peddlers on the railway station very impressive but this should reduce the period from 15 days to 7 days and you are proposing increasing the period from 7 15 days to 30 days now if 30 days then it will the investigation of two months will go to 120 days 90 days to 180 days it will all double then at the end of the day will we have efficient policing or that's for you to say making confession to police officer admissible confessions are known to be oral evidence and confessions are known to be extracted involuntary you have electronic methods of detecting crime today uh, cyber conferences you have Uh, other methods of narco analysis and others use them more efficiently and don't bother about this uh, once uh, confession are made admissible police will not go in for any other evidence danda maro is confession nikal kisi tarah se confession isko hawai jahaz bana do ulta latka do then you are making things cruder instead of more scientific that was expected and the third proposal is of making empowered lowering the standard of proof from beyond reasonable doubt to clear and convincing standard from burden of proof reduced from criminal justice burden beyond reasonable doubt to 
civil justice burden to easing the burden of proof. Conviction rate badhega. We'll be able to increase the conviction rate. Now, this is with a view to make an empowered criminal justice system, torturing criminal justice system, encounter criminal justice system, a fearful criminal justice system. Are you, the, minister, the, 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 the elected representative of the people are free to frame any criminal justice policy because you are the government. But this is what I conclude with. A democratically elected government is fully justified to carve out its own criminal justice policy. But how such a policy will tie up with the constitutional foundations is a matter to be taken into consideration not only by the elected representatives and the governing elite, but also by those who enforce the rule of law and the constitution. Police has got to talk of constitutional foundations. Judges have got to talk of constitutional foundations. Prosecutors have to talk of, lawyers have to talk, law students have to talk, law teachers have to talk. Because viewing criminal justice as a power resource may appear to be exciting and rewarding in the short run. Hum jis tarah ka criminal justice chaate hain, us tarah ka banayenge. Maybe using criminal law as a power resource may be exciting. It's very exciting times. We are living in very exciting times. We have caught cow slaughters. We lynch them. We have caught love jihadis. We lynch them. But short run, but to build an enduring and critical system, you have to ultimately fall back upon the normative foundations provided by the Constitution and the rule of law guarantees. Because getting away so much from the normative system and getting hooked up to law as a power resource system is neither good for you nor for larger society. Unless there are times of revolution. That can be done in times of revolution. But that cannot be done in peaceful times. Either you have to say that these are times of transformation and revolution in the society. This is the third freedom that has come. After emergency was the second freedom. And this is the third freedom that has come. Or you have got to harp on constitutional foundations. You have got to bank on the normative rule of law as a normative system. I may sound a little conservative. I may sound a little, I've mulled over this because uh, in my thought process, I am a fan of uh, revolutionary thinkers like Richard Queeney, like Chemlis and others. But uh, unless you have uh, weighed the pros and cons, we might lead to a situation of anarchy. I think with that, I will stop. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I'm, I'm doing my final year from Law College, Dehradun. Sir, uh, a small thought from, from whatever lecture you were giving me. You told killers, one who have been lawfully given rights to kill and another who are killing. So, but don't you think there should be a discrimination between murderers, rapers, and then you have to come to killers? Because comparing a soldier and comparing a murderer will be two different things. 
that's what one question I would like to put forward. Your question. This criminal law, there was a time for almost 200 years, there was a benefit of clergy. And that benefit exempted the criminal liability against a person who had that benefit. Initially, that benefit was given to the church people. A limited number of people involved in the church, meditation, etc. So give them benefit. Criminal law will not apply to them. But later on, it was abused. All people who could read and write started claiming benefit of clergy. Criminal law for illiterate became different and criminal law for literate became different. Now, if you say army men killing is different, army men killing in the war is different, army men killing in Sofian is different, you killing civilian population is different. Um, they were throwing that uh, they were throwing stones. Now for throwing stones, this is disproportionate use of force. For throwing stones, you do not kill. Now the argument is the military people have, like everybody else, or even more, a right of private defense. They have right of necessity. But you cannot indiscriminately. There is an article, uh, Right to Information Act by Commonwealth Initiative, which says that in uh, between 2002 and 2014, 50 cases were sent for permission to the army headquarters for prosecution, permission to prosecute. Out of them, 47 permission not granted, and three are pending permission. And these 50 cases include uh, cases of rape, cases of molestation. Now, in the war front, if you justify even rape, because military function is very tough, very arduous, we must have some pleasure and fun also, some rapes also should be justified. Now, if that is the idea, then to my mind, that is going too far. Exemption going too far. If right of private defense is there, if right of necessity, acting under necessity is there. So I have somewhere said, don't create holy cows within the criminal justice system. Above under joint secretary and below joint secretary and corruption of the rich people, corruption of the poor people, now, if you want to make distinction like this, then corruption will fall. Everyone, Neera Yadav's case is in my mind in February 2018. Neera Yadav is Chief Secretary of UP. She indulged in huge corruption, including buying two houses for her daughters in London. Itna corruption. And ultimately, the case started in 1994. And when the final it came to the Supreme Court, the High Court had given three years imprisonment. Because in between, she surrendered a lot of property and she surrendered a lot of money, etc. Her husband was also a bureaucrat, Mahin Singh Yadav. And the Supreme Court said, she has suffered a lot all these days. Oh, very kind. And, uh, from two, three years imprisonment, the imprisonment was reduced to two years, and then uh, two years she has remained in the prison. That, that was given set off. She can go home. Now, that, don't create holy cows like this. Economic offenders, rich people, influential people will take the criminal justice system totally. That is what in 1830. Five, if you go to history, Macaulay said that Bhadralok are saying, Bhadralok of Bengal are coming to me, European industrialists are coming to me, and they are saying, make two codes, one for the Indian slaves and one for our elite class. 
and he said this is the last thing i would like to do i will make one penal code for all whoever whoever kills commits murder whoever intentionally kills commits murder unless he falls in exception don't create holy cows that is my caveat only i am not uh, against uh, major saab major saab is a very nice man very kind and they are gentlemen but uh, don't say that major should be free to kill anyone you read uh, justice lokur's judgment in uh, manipur encounter cases you read justice lokur's judgment please do that and say uh, open um you pointed out that child marriage and child rape does occur here but the truth is that it actually happens in a lot of european nations as well in fact in the state of ohio in the united states of america there is polygamous marriages for young women there and that is because there is a sect of christianity that supports it um just an observation sir uh the second is i have two questions to this regard since pedophilia has become such a huge issue in the country shouldn't we look into um results such as chemical castration and i'd like to know your thoughts on that matter cuz there is no debate on that matter right now it's just death people just want to kill the rapist and the second one is uh rajasthan recently proposed law that says anyone below anyone who rapes a woman below 12 years old a girl below 12 years old should be put to death my question is why the 12 year old gap what is the watermark there why is it 12 years old are you telling me is it acceptable more acceptable to rape someone who is 13 or 12 and 1/2 years old um in consonance with that question again why do we always consider 18 years of age i understand that there's an act that says 18 years makes you a major but why hasn't it improved why hasn't the jurisprudence said 16 years for driving if you can drive at age of 16 why not improve on that as well thank you sir in the us you have certain worse practices that doesn't justify our bad practice at all worse practices they must also change and there people will be holding these kind of conferences orientation program they must hold you must advise them we are talking of our society and i am really worried as to your question number 2 and question number uh, two questions uh, chemical castration uh, will it fall within disproportionate punishment or proportionate punishment second below 12 now uh, subramanya saab is in his note also has mentioned that there is an ordinance to that effect by union of india that uh, rape with a girl below the age of 12 shall be punished with death now that becomes death punishment becomes very easy uh, handle you use law as a power resource humne dikha diya jo kehte the wo kar diya हमने सब चीज के लिए डेथ थेफ्ट के लिए भी डेथ कर दो इन इस्लामिक कंट्रीज थेफ्ट के लिए दे कट द हैंड्स देन ही बिकम्स अ मेम पर्सन नाउ ऑल द सिविलाइज्ड वर्ल्ड हैज सेड दैट दिस इज टू मच एंड बट आई एम नॉट आई हैव नॉट एग्जामिनड इट द पनिशमेंट पार्ट विल कम मच लेटर एविडेंस हैज टू बी देयर trial has to be there and uh, the statistics empirical statistics says 82% rapes are acquaintance rapes not stranger rapes acquaintance is chacha tau bhatija bhanja same family siblings who will give evidence again father raping his daughter the wife and everybody blocking the girl to give evidence again you be it has happened and the whole family has stood by the father for 3 years he has been there now 
how will you bring evidence? Now, death sentence, if you say, it, it doesn't make any difference. That you will not reach the sentence level. There will be no evidence. There has been a wonderful study by your uh, uh, National Law School, Bangalore, group, people who have said that under POXO, the conviction rate is low because most of the offenses are by evidence. And so there is no evidence. The conviction rate is low. They have done empirical study. So how are you going to enforce that, uh, firstly, it is disproportionate punishment. Secondly, it will invariably lead to elimination of the victim. For murder, I will have got a death sentence. For rape, also, I am getting death sentence. So let me eliminate the victim. There will be equal risk. Let me eliminate her. There will be no evidence. No, you are compelling the man to be more brutal rather than to be more kind. No, you can see in your, our understanding, there is a Bombay case of rat pickers rape. A girl has been raped, she was a rat picker of 40 years of age, by 12 people for few hours. A gang rape. But she has not died. Fortunately for us, those who talk of the victim, she has not died. So rape doesn't lead to death necessarily. That rat pickers rape case is as horrendous as Nirbhaya case. It has not come to light. Majlis Center has given them support and Majlis Center is writing about that rat picker rape case in Bombay. So you must understand these issues more deeply. Don't go episodically. principle and uh, differential application of law. In 2013, the definition of rape was widened. I heard that when the amendment was carried on, that it, uh, uh, they wanted to make it as uh, gender neutral. But because of the Nirvaya case, they did not make it as a gender neutral. The def same definition in respect of the rape, when we look into the Pokso Act, the same definition is taken, but in POXO it is gender neutral. But in 375 it is only a, ma a man commits the offense, it is a rape. So do you think that we are in an era of lobbyists who are bent on creating law? Of law. Here in, when it, we take 375, it is a man who commits the rape. But when we, when we take POXO, here any person, even a third uh, man, woman or any third party person can be a, a neutral general person can be a, a, a perpetrator as such. Here again there is a, as you said, differential application of law. Here it is a differential application of law and uh, two laws are there for the same offense. In article 14, there is a new cool. The POXO is a law against children, victimization of children. A rape is a law against uh, victimization of women. It's a gender crime, known internationally. Therefore, in Western countries, they have made it, uh, rape also gender neutral in UK, in many countries. And now, similarly, you have uh, Atrocities Act, which is uh, caste uh, centric. So there is intelligible differentia between different laws. And that is not violation of Article 14. Intelligible differentia can be made. You have can be intelligent to make a distinction between one group needing protection more than the other. Thank you, sir.